Good afternoon and welcome to the Christian Union Island podcast. My name's Marcus, I'm head of comms at Christian Union Island. As you can see, we're currently at Equip 2022. Um, I am very, very delighted to have with me today Isabel. Um, and also we have with us a very special guest, Kenny Robertson. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and we are gonna do a very fun and interesting conversation on creativity and faith. Um, so we hope you enjoy it. Isabel. Amazing. Um, yeah, so my name's Isabel Quinlan. I work in uh, South East, uh, Southeast of Ireland uh, in a couple of little universities there. Um, but yeah, so I'm a mum mostly. Um, but we've been at Equip and hanging out with a lot of creative students and we've just finished a workshop and uh, Yeah, it's just, um, that's why we're here. We're uh, chatting all things creative and we happen to have the lovely Kenny Robertson with us. So Kenny, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name's Kenny. Um, I live in St Andrews on the east coast of Scotland and work part, well, part-time stay-at-home dad and part-time uh, work with Christian unions across Scotland um, trying to help them um, share the gospel uh, with their friends on campus um, and help them think about how to answer their difficult questions as well. So Right. Unreal. That's awesome. Kenny, when you think about creativity mm. and you think about, you know, your talks and the direction that you'd be taking things, the travel, mm. um, what, what is creativity and, and how would you define it as a, as a starting point for those listening? Yeah, um, I would say I, I'd want to define creativity in the broadest possible sense. So I think when we think about creativity initially, we think about maybe the um, the the arts and the um, Um, the, you know, drawing and painting or doing photography or um, making music and that kind of thing. And yes, absolutely, that's, that's of course creative, but actually creative creativity can be even broader than that. I think one of the definitions that I've, I've been using for creativity is when you take anything, that any potential that you have in yourself or that you see in the world around you and you take that potential and you develop it, um, you are being creative. That's really cool. Yeah, so that, that could then include, of course, it includes uh, the arts and sports and music, but it also includes um, all sorts of um, lines of work. So even even something like accountancy, you're actually bringing order from something that is um, not necessarily organized. And um, that in itself is a creative thing. Engineering is, is in, immensely creative because you, you're using uh, mathematical principles to... Bring solutions to problems. That's a very creative thing. Um, so you can, and 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 also even just um, you know baking is a great example of creativity. And uh, baking is a great example um, because as somebody once pointed out to me that you know when the great British Bake Off started off, you have that in the UK. Do you have it in Ireland? Is it shown here? Um, great British no, Bake people watch it. It's okay. A bit of an so like yeah, when it first started, somebody said, you know, why is this so popular? And he said, well, he said baking, if you think about it, is is one of one of the few things, the few creative things you can do that is inherently selfless. He said, "You very rarely do you bake a cake and then eat the entire thing yourself. <laughs> so maybe, sometimes maybe you do, but but like for the most part, you bake for other people. I so might have been known to do that once or twice. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So, but you, you do, it's it's like there's an inherent generosity to, cre to baking, uh, which is, um, you know, which is it's just part of what it is. You know, you, you do it for the love of, seeing the smile on someone's face when you get to give them some bacon and that's just great so along those so. lines so i've heard that you have got like 150 buns or some sort of baked <laughs> thing for a quip at your <laughs> session or your seminar yeah it's basically What? like <laughs> i'm just like trying to recruit people to come to my my seminars I'm like, we got bacon come to our one but we um well it's because our sessions are all about creativity so i was like let's and i know that basically we're in northern ireland and like in scotland northern Irish students are known for their love of home baking. They love a tray bake. So like, I was like, well, we're in the home of the country of tray bakes. Why don't we, why don't we use that in our, to, to kind of illustrate our, our thinking about creativity. Land of the tray bakes. Yes. I think we <laughs> should call this episode Land of the tray bakes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Kenny, uh, you've been doing like loads of stuff on all of life and mm. um, how to worship God. In all of life, I think. But mm. can you tell us about like the origins of creativity? So we're talking about like the what is it? What actually bring us back? What is the origin? Yeah. So, well, this is what we were looking at in my session this morning. It was um, that actually creativity goes right back to the very beginning. And I was saying that 
you know, if you think about some of the different things, what what are all the different creative things? Well, maybe you can answer this. What what are the different creative things that humans can do? So, baking one. Name some other ones. Sports. Sports. Yep. Music. Music. Podcasting. Podcasting. Very creative yep. thing. Drawing. <clears throat> yep. Interior design. Interior design. Great example. Yeah. So it's endless, isn't it? It's an endless list. Do you know in your session this morning I said sleeping? Um, oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, yes, well. And, was, and I'm very good at it. Like, it's yeah. one of my best creative <laughs> skills. Like, I'm actually really bad. Well, there is a creative element to sleep. You think about your dreams, you know, it can be quite wacky. Yes. You know, you know they're just like, what's That's going on in the true. mind yeah. when you're asleep, right? Um, but what I was saying was, you know, we do these things simply because we enjoy them. But actually what we don't often realize is... Um, that being creative was the very first thing that God commanded humans to do. So you go right back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 and 2. The first thing he says to Adam and Eve is, he says, be fruitful and multiply, go and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fishes of the and the birds of the air. And then and then in Genesis 2, um, that's given a bit more definition when he, he says, um, go and work at the garden and take care of it and, and tend the garden. And so basically, he the first command he gives to Adam and Eve is, I want you to um, go out into the creation and to to fill it and to subdue it and to develop it and take care of it. And so he's encouraging them to create culture. And Julian Hardiman, the author, this is where I get my definition of creativity, where he says um, that actually what we mean by culture, by making cultures, culture is just anything where we are, seeing the potential in creation and developing it. And so really what God is calling Adam and Eve to do as humans, the first thing he tells them to do, is to continue his creative work. So that he says at the end of the six days of creation, each, each day he says that it was good. And he, he, he enjoys his creation, but he, he enjoys the beauty of it. But he doesn't say it was finished. And actually he's left an image of himself on the earth with a mandate to continue that creative work that the God in the six days of creation he formed and he filled and then he encourages humans to go and do the same and I just think that that's like the most dignifying enriching thing that God could have said to us as humans that you know we as I said we, we already do these things because we enjoy them and then we realize actually that that's we do them because like God positively commands us to go and do those things that we inherently enjoy. That being creative is is just so so liberating and enriching as a human, and yet that's what we're made to do. It's amazing. I, yeah, I find it so like trusting that God would like mm. give us the gifts to do it, and then mm. actually give us the space to do it. So like mm. He's made peaches, and yet we've made peach pie or whatever it is. Mm. That like I don't know, it's so trusting or something, isn't it? He could have yeah. been like, I've done the creativity, and yeah. now it's done. But yeah. it's like, no, you guys go do it. Yeah, and and I was like even just reflecting. Like one of the one of the things we've always wanted to teach our kids, we got three kids back in Andrews, and we always wanted to teach them from a young age is just we say thanks every time we eat a meal. Why do we do that? And we're like, well, we want to recognise that everything that we have as humans is a gift from God, and but even in the process of cooking a meal, he 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 provides for us. He gives us the money we can to buy the food, or we're able to grow the food in our garden. We dig it up, we cook it, we prepare something beautiful out of it. We we are developing. We, he given us the core ingredients, and we, he, he, we then he gives us the skills to develop that and produce something that is that is a sensory experience in a positive way. I mean, you know, when you, when you have the privilege of eating a meal that someone has lovingly prepared for you, and when they're really good at cooking, it's just like an absolute privilege to eat it, isn't it? And, and it fills your stomach, but it also fills your fills your your nose with the smells and the, you know the 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 context in which you're eating it in terms of being in relationship with other people it's an absolute gift and so yeah. that's why like saying grace or, or you know and a meal is not just a perfunctory duty that you have to do as a christian but it's actually just sitting and acknowledging this is a gift this is an absolute gift and, and it just means you enjoy it much more because you recognize it for what it is mm. yeah one of the things that's really interesting about where you've gone with this you started broad said so, you know mm. creativity is as many of these things as it possibly can be and then you've gone and you've taken us down the path of the origins and the origins would seem to suggest that this is something that we all have what would mm. you say to that person who would say look i'm i'm not a creative person mm. i you know, I, I, I don't have any special skills. I don't do anything creative. Like, mm -hmm. you know, really creativity is not for me. I, yeah. you know, I, I'm just a, 
a numbers person or I'm just yeah. a, you know, I'm, I'm just a more thoughtful, logical person. I don't yeah. do anything yeah. creative. How would you speak to, to someone of, of, of that mindset? I think what I'd want to ask them is, are you a human being? <laughs> like genuinely, because it could be cause, because if, if it's true that the first thing God commands humans to do is go be creative, um, then it's, it's not just that this is what he tells Christians to do, that, if you are a human on the planet, this is what it means to be human, is to be creative. And so I would say that, and this is why I'd always push back on, you know, people who are like, oh, I'm, I could, I, you know, I tried doing art at school and I couldn't paint for toffee. Like, and you're like, well, actually, creativity is so much more than that. If you're, if you're a person of logic, then, then I, you know, one of, the, one of the distinctives we see about the way that God creates in Genesis 1 and 2 is that he's He's a God who brings order where there is chaos. Mm. So you see there's an order in the way that he creates. You know, day, days 1 to 3, day 4 to 6. There's, it's so ordered, you know. Um, and that's one of the beauties of studying science is we get to see the uniformity of mind that was behind the creation. And I was chatting to another staff member afterwards and he was he's a surfer in the North Coast and he was saying... He says, one of the things that blows me away whenever I go surfing is, like, waves have such order to them. Obviously, you know, there's some days when it's messy and all that. But when you go out and, you know, th there's an order to it. And and then we were chatting about how, when if you think about how how tides work, I was blown away when the time when I discovered that, you know, there's a theory that um, tides are actually driven by the lunar calendar. So the moon is like a hand that draws the tide in and out. And like there's, there's, a, there's a logic and an order to it. So if you're then a person who is purely logical, if you're someone who is a scientist, <clears throat> if you're someone who's into pure maths, what you are studying is pure logic. And there's a beautiful creativity about maths. That's why I loved it. It was my favorite subject at school. I did engineering as my undergrad. And it's just like, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. You know, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. So, so I would say that creativity is far more than just painting, and and that is a beautiful aspect of creativity. I, I myself, so I, my background when I first started doing student ministry, I was, I was sent as a as an engineering graduate. I was, I, we moved down to Cornwall, down in the southwest of England, and I, you know, I often say that there's back then there were two reasons people studied in Cornwall: either you were an artist or a surfer. That's why you went to Cornwall to study, and. Um, and I was a bit like, I, I don't really know how to relate to art students. I don't know like how, what makes them tick. And, but over that time, I was just totally blown away by l thinking about what does it mean to be an artist and a Christian? And what struck me was like, I'm like, you know, oh, I w I'm an engineering graduate. I'm not a creative person. That's, that's basically what I was saying. And I'm like, no, actually, I am a creative person. And then thinking no, there's loads of different ways in which I'm creative. So I love music. Um, I play the guitar, I sing, that's, that's, that's really creative. I, ca I can't do the visual arts in that sense, but one of my biggest passions as well is cinema. So I love thinking and reading about cinema, film history, um, and I've just been re-watching some early Martin Scorsese movies and just thinking about some of the ideas that they come up with. Um, and even just, just a basic appreciation of cinema is some if you enjoy creativity in that way then you might not be someone who can make a movie but you're someone who can appreciate a movie mm -hmm. and all the it's just the most wonderful com complexity of uh, art forms isn't it cinema because you've got cinematography and direction and acting and storytelling and all these different and music music and score is key to cin cinema as well isn't it it's it's a it's a whole mashup of different art forms brought together and you can the, you know, everybody's in a film in some way, aren't they? And we love storytelling. If you're someone who appreciates creativity, then in that sense, you are creative, aren't you? Because you can see the beauty of it and see the value of it and you, you enjoy it. And there's something about creativity of others that stirs within us a creativity ourselves. Mm. You know? So there's we're all creative if we're humans. That's a very long answer to your, <laughs> to your question. I went off and I'm asking. That was an exciting, exciting tangent for me. Great. Yeah. It's funny, like, even chatting with some of the students today, you know, like, there's an accountant, and then mm. it's kind of, you know, I'm, account I'm studying accountancy, but I like this, this, and it's mm. kind of a, you know, sort of thing where we often lump um, 
very logical personalities in one group and mm. you know expressive personalities in another group actually mm. it's just really interesting being able to bring those together mm. like and through history we see in art as well that like you know even geometry plays a huge part in yeah. art and like the yeah. those kind of aesthetics are built into the universe like built yeah. into how we're made yeah um, so it's kind of no surprise that like I don't know, logic would actually lead you to a love of art. Yeah. Or it could, couldn't it? Absolutely. And you, and you take some of the greats, like in the classics, like um, Da Vinci and you know, all that. You yeah. know, they loved their maths. They were, they were, is the term polymaths, is that right? When you when you study a variety of different subjects at once. No clue. And, and <laughs> so like, the guy was a genius at maths and you see that through his paintings. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which is, it was like, they, they, we, we live in a culture where um, our, our specialisms become more and more specialised. Hmm. Um, whereas that what well, hasn't always been the way in education, and then like you know. disconnected from each other as well. Yeah, like, absolutely. Totally. But it is entirely possible to be interested in both the science and the arts at the same time. You know, and I, yeah. I count myself as one of these. My <clears> background <throat> was in science, and now a huge appreciation for the arts. You know, the um, worst thing is we can't logical people can't count themselves out of arts. They can't get out of it. Like absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Um, Debbie and um, uh. In terms of like you were talking about our inherent creativity and our culture and stuff and like we know that we're in a world that isn't perfect like it's fallen and I guess the question is like why does creativity matter like why does it matter to our culture why should it matter especially in a fallen world where like yeah, yeah. you know the gravity of like I don't know life and death and Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's a great question. And I think this is one of the wrestles we really have as Christians. We think, well, that might have been the way that we were made as humans in Genesis 1 and 2. But then shortly after that, Genesis 3, the fall changed everything. Um, and now surely the only thing that counts is evangelism. Surely the only thing is we've got to get as many people to heaven as we can. And like I now I work as an evangelist and I'm passionate about evangelism and the urgency of it. Um, but just because the fall happened, um, it didn't. It didn't cancel out that original command that God gave. So even in even in the following chapters in Genesis four, Genesis nine, these, those early chapters of Genesis, we see people being creative. There's little references to verses where it talks about people making um, making uh, tools and, mm. and and being creative and doing different things. Um, and so, so actually, even after the fall, they are still continuing the mandate to be creative. Um, and then, and yeah, and all the way through the Old Testament, you've got examples of that, of different people doing different things. Um, and, and, and then when Jesus comes along, he, um, interesting, isn't it, that Jesus spent the best part of his adult life, which is not recorded in his Gospels. What was he doing? As far as we know, he was working as a carpenter. He was, he was creative, a creative cool. job. Um and and in the new creation, we actually see that it's, there's some curious verses which we tend to overlook when we're talking about the new creation. Um, but that actually it talks about the the splendor of the kings and um, being brought into the new creation. And so there's this sense in which um, the greatest parts of culture um, throughout the generations of history. Um, will be brought into the new creation and enjoyed for what they are. So culture isn't just wiped clean, um, but actually the the best parts of it will be refined and purified and re with the sin removed from them so that we can enjoy them in the new creation. Um, so, so, so that mandate to continue, to that mandate to create is, continues all the way through the Bible. And actually, I think... If, to gain an understanding of that, it's it's not that we have to choose between doing what's called the first great commission, which is that cultural mandate, and the second great commission, which is to make disciples. We don't have to choose between the two, but they're both part of our responsibilities on the planet as Christians. Um, and actually, I, th I think that creativity actually enhances our evangelism. It, it shows the world that... You know, Jesus came to give us life in its fullness. He didn't give us, he didn't come to give us a diminished experience of life, but actually life with more color in it, not not with less color in it. And so we we, we need to think more carefully about what what is it what is the life that Jesus is calling us to, um, in Him, and and how do I enjoy life more, being with Jesus, not less. Um, I heard a really good quote in the book recently. It was like. Um, how do you justify 
your art as a Christian. I was yeah. like, you need to flip that around. Yes. You can only justify art as a Christian. Yeah. And that, like, <laughs> yeah. As image bearers, then like we're literally carrying out a duty that God has yeah. given us, like yeah. entrusted to us. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Like, yeah. I think, I, I don't know, it makes me wonder when people see creatives actually doing that in the image yeah. of God. Yeah. Like, yeah. does it in some way, yeah. like, resound with us a little bit about God, even if we yes. don't believe in God? Yes. Like, even if someone's Absolutely. like, nah, but yeah. they still, they love creativity. They don't know yeah. why. Yeah. yeah. But, like, they maybe yeah. are seeing glimpses of God. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking about it in terms of cinema. So, like, I, as I was saying, I've been, I've been re watching some early Martin Scorsese movies. As, okay, if I can go down a real nerdy path. Please do. Here. Which movie? Um, well, a whole bunch of them. So, there's a, there's a period of film history called The American New Wave, which was made in like the 60s and 70s. Mm. And it was during a really bleak time in American cultural history. So, you had Vietnam. You had Watergate, Nixon. People were really cynical about politics and about everything. And there's a whole bunch of filmmakers who made a bunch of films that explored some of these questions. So Francis Ford Coppola, made, uh, who, who's famous for The Godfather, he made a movie called The Conversation, which is all about um, um, government spying and all this kind of stuff. And then, and then you had Scorsese making movies like Mean Streets, Taxi Driver, um, and then, um, the, um, what's the other one I watched? Oh, there's a really depressing film called Serpico, starring Al Pacino. Serpico. Serpico. It's an amazing cop movie. It's really bleak, but it's about this this cop who um, who starts it. He wants to be a good cop, but and he just wants to find bad guys, put them in prison. But he he really struggles because he discovers that basically the whole of the cop department are so corrupt that he can't do it, and it becomes increasingly impossible for him simply to do the right thing. And so what these movies do is is they're basically, I mean, they're really depressing to watch, <laughs> but what I love about them is they're just so honest about the state of the world. They're like showing they're, a reality. Like, yeah, really absolutely. Well. Yeah. So they're, they're the complete antithesis of Disney movies. So they're, mm. they don't just have a beautiful character arc that all resolves everything at the end. They're completely unresolved. Like they, they ask questions about, how, how gritty life is and they don't necessarily have all the, t- the answers to so it doesn't life. tie up neatly at the end well it just it just raises the question but okay, it doesn't wow. necessarily like so Serpico which ends on a really bleak note it and like work. yeah it's Taxi Driver is just it's just the, one of the most dep- like you've got to be careful watching them because they are really depressing but at least they're being really honest yeah. Yeah. about the state of the world yeah. and that's what the American New Wave is, mm. is known for it's just like they're yeah. willing to ask those bold questions that other filmmakers sometimes aren't as willing to ask and I think there's something about like there's something about that as Christians we can affirm mm. because yeah. because what they're saying is they're saying the world should be a good place and it's not and it's wrong that it's not like this and as Christians, we can say amen to that. Like that is that is their reality that they're exactly. experiencing. So they're actually responding to that, but also doing it beautifully. So yeah. that it's like, it's both, the form is amazing, but also yeah. the content is like, it's really true for them. Yes. But like, I don't know, I guess another question is then like, so say your, say your content is like, well, yeah, so there's a Christian who's mm. like living in the 60s and stuff as well. Mm. who's really gifted with this. Mm. Or say Scorsese become a Christian. Mm. I don't know if he did. Probably not. Well, what's interesting about Scorsese is that he actually comes from a very strong Catholic background. Oh. So he's he's famous. <laughs> another nerdy tangent here. <laughs> Scorsese is really famous for his gangster movies. But actually, if you look at the entire body of his work, he's also asking profound questions about spirituality. So he just very recently did this movie called Silence with Adam Driver in it, which is about oh. a, a pair of Jesuit, Adam Driver and Liam Neeson, a pair of Jesuit priests who go out into some unreached people group to try and... Um, try and convert them and then are faced with all sorts of doubts of faith and all this kind of stuff. Like Scorsese has all sorts of hidden films there about about faith and everything. And even even in Mean Streets, which was his first gangster movie, one of the characters played by um ah, oh, what's his name? Um Harvey Keitel plays this and, and De Niro, Robert De Niro are in this movie. Harvey Keitel plays this gangster who's wrestling because he wants to become a made guy, but at the same time he comes from a Catholic background and he feels like he ought to be doing the right thing by his by his religious upbringing, but yet wants to be mm-hmm. a gangster at the same time. So even in this character, you actually have someone who is semi-autobiographical for Martin Scorsese, um, who who wrestles with this himself. So so he, he is, a, yeah. Well, I guess like what I'm asking is, um, 
so it came up recently my dad studied art and he mm. went to see a Lucian Freud exhibition when he was a student I think mm. um, so Lucian Freud does these uh, they're nudes and they're like they're showing humanity but at its kind of it's very raw it's not like aspirational in any way mm. um, but it's definitely a reality mm. um, and it, they're done mm. really well like he's, he's really good so Lucian Freud I think is like um, Freud you know the famous Freud's grandson okay think, Sigmund Freud um, but anyway yeah he was a really good painter but I was looking at the, they had a profound effect on my dad. And the reason it, the reason they did is because it kind of showed humanity, but without any sort of glory about it. It was yeah. kind of yeah. humanity nearly stripped of its image of God. Yeah. And I just yeah. thought that's fascinating. And yeah. it made me just wonder, you know, because we're living in this world as well, where, you know, the image of God is definitely not, you know, particularly yeah. acknowledged or celebrated by yeah. most people. And so, um, you know, if, if that's the earth that you're around, or if that, if they're even, if that's the culture that you're swimming in, yeah. um, you're probably going to sense a bit of that or you're yep. probably you're going to relate to that yep. kind of stuff yep. i guess i'm just wondering like as a christian um i could see a christian actually doing that kind of art but yep. doing it in a nearly prophetic like a ecclesiastes way yes. like this is life yep. under the sun yep. without god this yep. is humanity stripped of its yes. of its image of yep. god if you know yep. what i mean well something that um something that chris wright said in his session this morning really stood with me where he said that part of the so he so chris is doing this um, he said that the, the whole story of the Bible is a, is a drama in seven parts. And this morning he did the first two parts of that drama, which were the creation and the fall. And his conclusion was part of the experience of the Christian is living in the tension between Genesis 1 and 2 and Genesis 3. That actually we, we know that the creation is good, but yet at the same time, the world is a broken place. Now, the good news about Christians is that it doesn't, for Christians rather, is that it, we know that it doesn't end there. That, it, that, that actually then Jesus came in, died on the cross to redeem the whole of the cosmos and, and to set it in the direction towards the new creation. But, but for people who aren't Christians, really, if they're honest, their experience is living in the tension between the goodness of creation and the brokenness of creation, but yet they don't have the hope of Jesus. And that's the task of the Christian is mm. to is to enter in to the world and say, I I hear what you're saying. To what you know, to if, if it's if it's your thing, to to engage with people like that Freud and, and Scorsese and say, like, I see how you see the world. Yeah. And I want to affirm that what you see is true. Yeah. But let me offer you a different conclusion to what you think the conclusion might be. That's this really is not cool. all there is, but yeah. there is good news that speaks into yeah. this. But if we're not willing to listen to culture, then it's really hard for us to then speak into the culture. We have to be willing to to listen to what they're trying to say yeah. and hear what they're saying and figure out what what about this can I affirm mm -hmm. and then how can I offer good news? Yeah, and I think that's the reality that, that we have to embrace is that where we are right now is broken. Mm -hmm. The fact that it's broken creates a longing in us. If it wasn't broken, we wouldn't long for <clears throat> it being fixed. Mm -hmm. It's the brokenness, mm -hmm. the reality that we live in that gives us the deep longing for ultimately heaven mm -hmm. or future with Christ. Yeah. And, and, and that is the only hope. Like, yeah. Yeah. so I, I think that's the, that's the beauty of engaging that and mm -hmm. seeing that play out in creativity is yeah. something that I think would be an interesting dynamic to, yeah. to yeah. be explored. Yeah. There's a, it just ties in so well with what an artist, like in terms of what actually is an artist, like a creative person, like there's got to be a sensitivity or like we're each kind of created with different sensitivities to how the world is and to how reality is. And it's like it impacts us in slightly different ways. And um, I always think of it as like, uh, imagine each person is like a slightly differently shaped prism and then there's mm -hmm. like light coming through and it disperses in slightly different ways for each unique prism. But mm -hmm. um. I, that's how I kind of see creativity like flowing you know essentially starting beginning with God coming through us um, and being uniquely different to each person mm -hmm. but um, I, don't, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this so Paddy you could out if, I, if I'm not but there is um, we, we was in the staff office um, and there was a poem um, oh, yeah. and, and it was just left um, on the wall mm. um, but it I think it touches on some of these points really, really well. And I took a photo of it. So I'll read it and then we can, you know. I can... Googled this after because I was like, who okay, wrote this song? I couldn't find it. it. Okay. Mm. So it may be just that somebody has wrote it mm. and left it there from Amazing. either, you know, the past or, yeah. but 
So here we go. It says, until I learned, is the name of the poem. Until I learned to trust, I never learned to pray. I never learned to fully trust till sorrows came my way. Until I felt my weakness, his strength I never knew, nor dreamed till I was stricken that he would see me through. Whose deepest, whose deepest drinks of sorrow drink deepest too of grace. Mm. He sent the storm so he himself can be our hiding place. His heart that seeks our highest good knows well when things annoy. We would not long for heaven if earth held only joy. Mm. Mm. Incredible. Mm. But it's like the sensitivity of like the, like each person's uniquely experiencing even the sorrow and darkness of the world when they it's like reflecting back or even creating out of that is just mm -hmm. i don't know it's uniquely beautiful isn't it mm -hmm. and points to god it's not a hopeless story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really cool mm -hmm. so i mean just a caveat if if anyone's listened to this and they've written that poem and we didn't credit them please <laughs> message us well, your name isn't on it yeah, <laughs> it actually yeah. says daily schedule on it so that's all. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's her name daily schedule. Daily, it Thank could you, be daily. yes by daily yeah. schedule yeah. amazing poem <laughs> Yeah. So, um, Kenny, we were uh, like, obviously, we're working with students and they are doing evangelism in universities. Um, many of these universities are very creative, loads of creative students. But I suppose we're wondering, um, do you know, like what would be some ways that uh, Christian students, especially those who are in the arts, how can they connect with people who aren't Christians through the arts yeah. or through creativity? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Well, a couple of, a couple of things to say to that. One, one thing just to follow on from what. What we were just talking about is that we, if we see that you know um there's the creation and there's the fall and that people experience those things but they need the hope of the gospel i think it's helpful for us to think through what is the whole of the gospel mm -hmm. and that um if we if we think that the gospel is simply about uh, between me as an individual and god and that and that god um G jesus came to, to die for my sins uh, pay for my sins and give me a ticket to heaven. Um, that's true. I absolutely that, and I want to absolutely affirm that. But there's more to the gospel than that, because Jesus said He didn't just come to save me as an individual. He came to redeem the whole of the cosmos. So, what is the good news for creation? Um, that that Jesus. How does Jesus dying on the cross? How does that help the brokenness of creation? Because so Romans 8 talks about creation groaning mm. because of the weight of the effect of the fall on it. Um, and, and it longs for its liberation. Oh, that's so cool. And and there's just a beautiful picture, yeah. isn't it? Liberation. But, yeah, yeah. That the, the, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay is what Paul writes in Romans 8. And so, so actually you see the world around us falling apart and creation, uh, sorry, global, global warming is a massive issue and we're really worried about that. That actually, it's it's not the end. That actually, he's going to come and he's going to redeem the whole of the creation. And this is something that that Chris touched on this morning. That I'm going to be looking at later in the week. That that we often are tempted to think, well, it's all just going to burn up anyway. And the language that we get that from is from two Peter three when it talks about um, the world being destroyed by fire. And we think that what that means is the whole creation is going to burn up, and nothing's going to be left. And then we're all just going to float off to heaven and sit on clouds and play harps. Whereas actually, what the Bible says is that's that's not what it means when it says it's going to be destroyed by fire. It means it's going to go. It's going to be purged. It's going to be cleansed by fire, like like when you when you put a precious metal into mm. into a fire and it burns off the dross, so that you're left with the purity. Mm. He says he says in the same way that the flood, when the flood came in the time of Noah, it didn't completely destroy the whole planet. It 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 washed away all the sin and rebellion and you were left with the planet. It was clean. It was cleansed in the same way that when it goes through the fire as the image is. That's what it means. It's gonna be it's gonna be cleansed. And so we're gonna have this creation, but it's gonna be renewed and it's gonna be freed from all the effects of sin. And then we're gonna be able, with physical bodies, in the same way that Jesus was resurrected into a physical body. We're going to be given renewed physical bodies and be able to continue creating and enjoying God's creation, enjoying all the benefits of human culture through the ages, but cleansed from all of the sin. That's what we are inviting people to in the new creation. And so that's what the hope is. 
So you see, the gospel is so much more than just my individual ticket to heaven. Mm. It's it's so much broader and so much bigger than that. And that's so exciting for, and there's so much hope for a creation that is groaning, not just for individuals who need their souls saved. So we, we want to think more biblically and more fully about the gospel. So that's one thing, <laughs> is, to, is to, you know, say, first of all, Try digging in more deeply into what is the gospel for the creation. And then the second thing is actually just to use your God-given creativity in the way that you present the gospel. So one of the things I was struck with when I was working with art students down in Cornwall was actually, what does it look like for these guys to put on events that are attractive to this campus, to art students and surfers on this campus? Um, and and how, do we, how do we use those events to... to to give dignity to people's creativity and respect their creativity, but also to show them the hope of the gospel. So one of the things they did, which was amazing, was they when they were running an events week one year, um, we ran an art competition. And so the theme of the events week that year was something like freedom um, uh, or hope. or I can't remember what, the, what it was that year. And so we basically put all these adverts out on campus and said, art competition this week, um, submit any piece of art in any artistic genre um, under the theme of freedom. Or it was hope. freedom. I was wasn't freedom. there, but it was freedom. Oh, you heard about this? How do you oh, know? Oh. You told me. <laughs> oh, did I? Okay, yeah. We spoke about it yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I remember what it was. <laughs> I think maybe we did it a couple of times. But it was, anyway, the, tied in with the theme of the week, submit any piece of art. And then part of the budget that we had for the events, we, we were asking churches for help with money, is we put aside 100 quid um, as the prize for the events week because we wanted to make this uh, that was a nice little prize for a student to be honest absolutely and Seriously. we wanted to we wanted to honor people with the art that they were yeah. submitting we want to say we value your art that actually art is a valuable thing we want to say that um and so we got this 100 pound cash prize um and um and we did that genuinely to to respect and value them not just as a gimmick to get people along um but it definitely helped. <laughs> and and so so we had this competition and people submit. And then on the Friday night, the evening event of the events week, on the Friday night was, um, we had an art exhibition. We got three Christian um, artists. Um, two of them were just local artists who were Christians. And then another one was a guy who was helping out during the week. All art practicing artists. And we got them to come and be judges for the art um, exhibition and people could come in and we had cheese and wine and people could come and peruse the art chat to the people who made them um, and then and then the guy who was speaking in his talk he basically before his talk he went round and he considered all the pieces of art and what he thought they were trying to communicate through it and then he wove that into his talk and he said so so it seems to me what you know here we are talking about freedom what is freedom what what, what is it we're looking for when we think about freedom and it, and then he started by going around the pieces of art and saying, here's some of the things I'm observing in your artwork that you're looking for. Um, I hope, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but this is what I'm seeing. Let me show you what Jesus has to say about that oh, and what Jesus so cool. says about freedom. And he used their art, weaved it in, and then responded to their art with the hope of the gospel, which is just fantastic. Yeah. So it's just such a creative thing. Oh, it is just really cool. I think, we, honestly, we'd love to see, like, students having those ideas mm. and just, like, Oh, mm. I don't know, jumping into it, like, that's so cool. Mm. And speaking of students, of we had a student here today. Mm. And as we was talking to them, we was going around and asking them all to tell us about their creative backgrounds. And mm. one of them said that they was um, a student and they were studying something administrative because of the fact that they were scared they wouldn't make a career out oh, of their yeah. art. Okay. Um, and, yeah. and, and this, I think, is interesting because... Mm you know for our students and we have many conversations with students who they study art mm. they get a, their degree in art they go mm. into the graduate world and then they give up on art and they take mm. a job because they don't think that their creativity yep. is going to give them enough value or yep. give them the ability to have the job that they want so yep. they just put it on the side as a hobby um, yep. and creation yep. or creative is hobby yep. and the serious stuff yep. is the work yeah how would you encourage our students or our graduates who have just graduated going into the workplace and are looking for work yep. in the arts, what yep. would be your encouragement to them? Well, a number of things to say to that. Firstly, I would say that if we, if we think that arts are just for the hobbies and the serious stuff is for work, I really need to, re we need to rethink what we think the purpose of work is. That we don't exist just to work, but actually that, that as humans, we exist for lots of different things and work is part of it. Now it's great if you if you can if you can be paid for the thing that you most love doing. That's an incredible privilege. It's not always possible, but also 
Um, your work doesn't necessarily have to be the only thing that drives you in life. So I often say to people who are graduating, you know, and they're trying to figure out, oh, you know, what, um, <laughs> you know, what, where, where should I go and live, and what should, what job should I do, and all this kind of stuff. And I often say, well, the thing is, when you're graduating, there are four or five big factors that determine where you should live and what you should be doing. And work is only one of them. So one is, what kind of job do you want to do? Two is, um, where would you like to live? Three is, what church are you going to be involved in? Four is, have you any significant others that tie you to a particular place? So maybe you've got a boyfriend or girlfriend or you're about to get married or maybe you've got family members who um, uh, need you around or whatever. And then the five is, location. So you've got work, church, did I say one of them twice? Work, church, significant others, location. Maybe there's another one. Now, we tend to think, well, you go, you, you get the job first. You step on the career ladder. You get in the graduate program, all that kind of stuff. And then where the, where the job is, that determines all the other things. Mm. It's like, what about if we mix that around a little bit? What about if we said, do you know, do you know what? There's this church that I'm, I'm involved in. I really want to be a part of it. I'm going to get a job that just allows me to go and live yeah, in the place cool. so that I can mm. serve that church. Mm-hmm. Do you not think that God would honour that decision? You know? That's really cool. Um, and so, so that then applies when we think about the, the tension between the creative thing that we have a passion for doing and the work that we want to do. Mm. So the, does the job necessarily have to drive you know, what's, what's going Now, of course, we want to honour the gifts that God's given us. We have responsibilities for other people. You know, we want to... You know, you do. It's good to get a job, <laughs> but I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying, let's let's keep it in perspective, yeah, and let's not be driven by the world standards about you know career is the most important thing. Yeah, and it's not, and and it's it's worth remembering that your church yeah. is also an outlet for your creativity. Absolutely, your family is yeah. also an outlet for your creativity. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. to 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 do marriage well, yeah. to yeah. to raise children well, yeah. Yeah. that takes creativity. It yeah. takes levels of yeah. creativity and, yeah. and and thought and care because yeah. you're dealing with individuals who are unique yeah. and need creative investment and, yeah. and direction and yeah. growth and yeah. feeding and, yeah. and that is a uniquely creative thing to do and I think yeah, that's absolutely. where you if, if you can avoid these silos of your life of mm-hmm. sacred and secular mm-hmm. and you can realize that actually it's all sacred mm-hmm. and I'm to be creative with all of it mm-hmm. and I think that is a is a starting point in readdressing some of that thinking and these things that you're saying here are good ways for Israel yeah. to take them yeah. steps like I know for myself I I moved to Northern Ireland not for a job, not yeah. for um, you know a church, but I moved to Northern Ireland because this was the home of mm. my fiance, mm. and mm. and that drove our move. Yeah. Um, but it's such a beautiful thing yeah. to yeah. be able to not be tied to a I need to do it with my job or I need yeah. to do it with you know whatever it is, but yeah. that you you can be creative within all of the elements yeah. of your life. And now yeah. I'm here and I'm working. I'd hope to be creative. Uh, yeah. Pretty creative. In, in my <laughs> yeah, world. Absolutely. Um, not as creative as the guy behind the camera, yeah, but I, yeah. I, I do what I can. Yeah. Um, you know, so in, in that regard, I'm creative in my, my yeah. job, you yeah. know, and then we find a, ch- a church home where then, yeah. you know, I can be creative and your life yeah. shapes together, but it's yeah. not, it's not a sacred versus secular. It's not yeah. a, you know, job versus, yeah. you know, my yes. Christian living. Yeah. You know, yeah. So. And another thing to say into that is just the purely practical thing of like, it's brilliant to to give it a go of trying to make a living from mm. your creativity. Yeah. Um, it's not always possible, and so actually, one <laughs> something you can be creative about is how to go about that. So what is you know? So so I've, we've got a couple of um, artists in our church back in St Andrews who um, one is a potter. And the other is is a. I love is a, pottery. I'm in the middle of a course, and it oh, is fascinating. honestly the best thing. This okay. this this friend, she makes the most amazing uh, little pots and plates, and stuff. beautiful, mm. beautiful work. So she she's a potter, and she's passionate about pottery, and um, but she also recognises that it doesn't necessarily pay in the most conventional way. Um, and her husband is a painter, and he does beautiful, beautiful landscapes. He's re- they're both incredibly gifted. Um, but he's also like, I want to make a living out of this, but also I recognise that it takes time to do that. It takes time to establish yourself in ours. You gotta, you gotta just put the hours in. Um, you gotta, you gotta make a choice between, you know, purely creative and what's gonna sell. You know, you gotta, you gotta think about all that kind of stuff. Um, but also, he's like, I've got to get a job 
that pays the bills, but it also gives me enough freedom so that I can pursue my art. So he got a job with Vodafone, just doing sales, working in the shop. Um, and I, this guy's he's an incredibly capable guy, you know. And for some people, they might think, oh, working in retail or whatever is a bit demeaning for me. I want to, you know, I can push higher than that. But actually, you're like, yeah, consider the world's view on the work and then consider what's what's going to be glorifying to God, mm-hmm. you know, and, and think, what has he called you to do? And think, you know, it's really okay to stack shelves in Tesco or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, like that that in itself is a... It, that can be glorifying to God. It's not like some jobs are more more godly than others. Okay. So, like, and, you know, give some respect to the people who actually work in Tesco's if you think like that, because mm-hmm. they are humans <laughs> who have a job and, you know, um, they, they that is dignifying. Yeah. Um, and it's creative and, you know, you can bring creativity into that. But just to be, think, think creatively about um, how do I, how do I develop my, my creative gifts in a way that, you know, think long term about it. And how how do I establish myself as an artist? I think the key thing about that, if you're moving from student life into graduate life, and you're someone who who is creative in terms of the visual arts and that kind of thing, I think what's absolutely vital is get involved in a community of creatives who are both committed to scripture and thinking biblically about the arts. Yeah. Um, but who also um, are trying to practice it, you know, and I think trying to find a group of creatives who do both of those things. What's the benefit of that? Well, the the benefit is that I think you need people who are like you, who understand the pressures that you face and the questions that you have about your creativity, um, but who can help you both think through it biblically, um, but also can help you with some of the practicalities of how do I make decisions about how to pay the bills and all this kind of people who have been there before you. So in the UK, we have a fantastic organisation called Morphe, who um, who basically sprung out of a student ministry to art students. And then they were seeing students graduate from art college and then stepping out into the real world. But then suddenly, you know, in the world of the visual arts, there's just not a there's not a large Christian presence, mm-hmm. so it's just a really difficult place to be a Christian, because um, if you're not if you're if you're on your own trying to think biblically about the arts and you're surrounded by people who are coming at it from a secular perspective, mm-hmm. that's incredibly difficult and challenging. Um, so you need you need other Christians around you to support you in that. Um, but also, it, you know, it just it helps. Um, also, I, you know, I think. Often in our churches, um, we we have quite a narrow view of the Christian life and of salvation and of creation, and so sometimes uh, the visual arts just aren't as valued as other things. You know, and it's like can you not go get a real job and you know do this? Good, you know, you face a lot of that stuff, and so having people around you who say no, you know, God has called you to be an artist. That's a that's a wonderful thing. That's a really godlike thing to do because God is the creator. He's created us in his, in his image, and you're wanting to redeem the world of the visual arts. We need Christians in the visual arts to to be a redemptive presence there for the gospel. Um, so you need support in that. Yeah, because it sounds like loneliness in this particular area mm. might be very discouraging. Or absolutely, yeah, yeah, and and we're not created to be Christians on our own. There's no such thing as a solo Christian. Yeah. Like it's it's part of our DNA. We are born into the family yeah. of believers, you know. So we need community around us that are going to help us with those questions. Can can I can I end mm. with this focus? Um, I'm a young Christian artist, and mm. my desire is to desperately glorify God with my life. Fantastic. Can you encourage me? Can, can you? Can you talk about the blueprint of creativity and how that is glorifying to God and how mm. God used creativity as a blueprint to glorify his son? Yeah, and yeah, that absolutely. Was, that, that absolutely. So like it says in the New Testament, Paul writes this um, in Colossians, uh, the writer of the Hebrew writes this, John writes it in the beginning of his gospel that actually it was through Christ that all things were created. Um, so we tend to think when we think about creation, we tend to think um, it was God the Father doing it, but actually, God the Father initiated it, and He He did it through His Son, who was empowered by the Spirit. It was an, an inherently Trinitarian work, the work of creation, and 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 in Colossians it says that all things were created through Him 
and for him. In other words, Christ is not only the agent of creation, but he, he's also its goal. And, and so the purpose, if we want to ask, you know, why did God create the world the way it did? Why, why did he create it? With so many bizarre little sea creatures, you know, like, and why, 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 like, when you watch David Attenborough, uh, sorry, uh, that's a very British oh, thing. Oh, no, we don't have to get up in here. When you watch David Attenborough <laughs> and you, you just think, what is going on with these, all these creatures? Like, that thing is weird. And like, isn't it beautiful? There's just the sheer diversity. It's like, why did God create the universe like this? Why didn't he just make it a functional place? You know, like, why did he create it with such beauty and diversity and humor, you know? That these, these, some of these fish are hilarious, you know. Like, what, why did he do it? And it says, actually, he did it all for Jesus. He did it to bring glory to him. So that when we look at the creation, we just think, wow, God, aren't you amazing? You know. And then to think that, actually, if, if Jesus had the hands that flung those stars into space, that then he, not only did he create in the first place, but he continues to be involved in his creation, sustaining all things by his powerful word, day after day after day. Every second we live is a gift from him, even the breath that we breathe. Then he did all of that, and yet he was willing, because we messed it up, to step into the human realm, to be, to be subject to death on a cross, so that then he could redeem it all. You know, it's just the ultimate example of God continuing to care for his creation, to be involved in his creation. You can see, like, it's not just, it's not just God's creation that brings Christ glory, but actually then his redemption does as well. The new creation will do even more. And so, so actually when we are, when we are anything that we do that takes the potential that's in us or in the created order, and that we develop that and we continue God's work after him, we are bringing glory to Christ as we do it. Now, obviously, everything that we do will be tainted by sin. But, but if we are united to Christ, if we are in him, then we are becoming more like him day by day as Christians. Then actually, that he brings that, he, begin, he redeems the creative work that we do as well so that we can, we can increasingly more day by day say, Jesus, I am doing this for you. Every time I create a new little pot on my pottery, turntable or every time I paint a new um, picture or every time I I uh, go for a run and enjoy his his pleasure by running I say Jesus I'm doing this for you not for myself then but then uh, we are bringing glory to him so good Kenny thank you so much oh it's Isabel, such a privilege oh, so, so exciting much. to chat yeah. guys it's been a pleasure thank you so much for joining us we look forward to having so much more to talk about on the topic of creativity moving forward thanks for joining the cui podcast see you next time